Hello, everyone. I'm Evo Dalder, president of the Chicago Council on Global Affairs, and this is World Review, our weekly look at news from around the world. Let me start off by thanking Kim Gaddis and Carla Robbins for sitting in for a couple of weeks while I was away. Uh, wonderful to have had them. Uh, I'm starting to fear for my job here. Uh, they were really terrific. Uh, but thanks to them uh, and uh, and for all of you to continue to tune in. And, and this week, let's look at the big stories. First of all, China. Xi Jinping is consolidating power, uh, not only in the, in the party, but the party is consolidating power over the state. Uh, and he is making very clear that he doesn't like what the United States is trying to do when it comes to containing uh, China. Then we'll take a look at Russia and its offensive in uh, eastern Ukraine, an offensive much heralded, been looked at as something that might be a game changer. Turns out it's sputtering, it's not working, and many, many, many Russians are being killed in the process. And finally, a look at India. After the G20 meeting, uh, chaired, uh, the, G the G20 meetings chaired by, by India, uh, foreign ministers and other meetings, the real question is, where is India going to go with its foreign policies that tried to bridge all of its many demands on the country with regard to its dependence on Russia and its oil, with regard to its relationship with China, and of course, its relationship uh, with uh, the West and the rest of the world. Here to talk about all of these stories are Nahal Tusi. She is the senior foreign affairs correspondent at Politico. Wonderful to have you back, Nahal. And uh, Ravi Agrawal, who is the editor-in-chief of Foreign Policy. Ravi, great to see you back. And Steve Erlanger, Chief Diplomatic Correspondent in Europe for the New York Times. Steve, great to see you again. Nahal, let's start with you. Uh, uh, as I said in the introduction, uh, China is, uh, is changing, and, and Xi Jinping is consolidating his power. The uh, parliament met today, to, to uh, the, this week. Uh, to give him his third term uh, as president, but also really putting the Xi Jinping stamp on the party and on China. What does that mean for the relationship that China will have with the rest of the world? And how strong do you think the power is that, Ch that Xi Jinping now has? Uh, well, you're going to be proud of me. I actually did some research. <laughs> um, basically, China has a rubber stamp legislature that affirmed Xi Jinping's third term as the country's president. Um, and I had to kind of laugh out loud when I when I read this, but this legislature has 2,952 members and the vote was unanimous. Uh, so she is now the longest serving leader in the country's modern history. And you know, let's take a moment to note here for a second that this is a guy who basically has scored a coup inside an authoritarian communist government. Like it or not, it's a thing that takes skill. Um, so C has taken a number of other recent steps that also seem to suggest a greater role for the Chinese government, uh, including new regulatory bodies for much of the country's financial system and data and digital technologies. It's all a bit opaque, but it does seem like it's just another move that will blur the lines between the Communist Party and the administrative state. And of course, the party is the one that is dominant, more powerful than ever. Um, and it kind of erases some of the changes that Deng Xiaoping tried to make in terms of having a more professionalized administrative state, civil servants, that sort of thing. Um, now, all of this comes against a backdrop of worsening U.S.-Chinese relations and a slowing Chinese economy. So on the one hand, the economic problems, which were exacerbated by Xi's zero COVID policies, mean Beijing could probably use some friendlier relations with the U.S. and with Europe. But instead, because of everything from spy balloons to the partnership with Russia amid the war in Ukraine, those relationships are getting even worse. And in the last few days, we've seen commentary from top Chinese officials, including Xi himself, warning of a greater risk for conflict with the United States, which, of course, they blame on the United States. They seem to see no value in backing down. And also, I just want to throw in a word here that I'm not going to get too much into, but Taiwan, that, that is the, you know, the thing that looms over everything, that flashpoint. Um, now, at the same time, there's some interesting maneuvering by Beijing in the international space. There are reports today that China has brokered a restoration of diplomatic relations between Saudi Arabia and Iran. That's really extraordinary. So on the one hand, you, you have... Uh, uh, 
leader, a Chinese leader who's consolidating powers at home. And on the other hand, he is um, taking moves in the international space that seem to show that he and his country can be a, a diplomatic broker in ways that the United States really can't. Um, C is 69 years old. He is a child in the political realm. He's like a toddler when you're 69. Um, he's not insanely inflexible as the decision to scrap the zero COVID policy shows, but there's only so far he will go in a system like that of the Chinese Communist Party. So I, I think things are going to get worse before they get better in terms of the relationship with the West. Uh, and But you know, this is one of those things where it can go any number of ways, depending on which front you're talking about. Uh, now, I think that's a really great summary of, of of where we are. Love the coup within an authoritarian system, uh, uh, which is a great great line, and 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 it's a successful coup by uh, by every account. Everyone who's now uh, in a position of power owes that position because of Xi Jinping and their loyalty to Xi Jinping. And so, so Ravi, I guess the the the, the big question. Uh, is you, you you get this sense and and the last week just reinforced it, including uh, with the uh, testimonies of their intelligence chiefs on on Capitol Hill, that these are two powers, the United States and China, that are you know to coin a phrase, sleeping sleepwalking into confrontation. Uh, they they are set on a path where the ability to to uh, find common ground seems less and less. Uh, and more and more intent to uh, find a way not just to compete, but actually to confront each other, even though neither side really wants confrontation uh, of that kind. Is there should, should, should we be worried about this or are there hopes and signs that, in fact, no, these uh, are two mature powers that will find a way uh, to live with each other? We should be worried. I mean, the sleepwalking uh, sort of th that phrase, Chris Clark will 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 approve of uh, how it's being used here. Um, but they're in an escalatory spiral. Uh, that that's sort of the phrase I like to think of uh, on the U.S.-China relationship because, you know, on both sides, uh, you have factions that no longer see it in their interest to calm things down. So in in America, uh, you have the Democrats and Republicans who can't agree on much. But if they want to get something done in Congress, just tie it to competition with China. And even if it's a domestic issue, it will get passed. Um, in China, it's increasingly popular to be uh, anti-American. Um, we know this from observing their media, but I think Xi Jinping's speech um, is very telling in that he used the word containment, that America is trying to contain us. Um, this is a Cold War era um, sort of Kennan word um, and I think the Chinese public will will cotton on to that word and its connotations and the history of what it means and what happened to the Soviet Union. The Chinese obviously study uh, Russian history uh, in terms of the Cold War. They don't want that to happen. They also study what's going on right now in Russia, and they don't want to fall into the same traps that Russia has uh, in its war with Ukraine. Um, that word containment, again, is used by some lower level officials in China, but it's it's telling that Xi Jinping chose to go there. Uh, he's been quite restrained, uh, despite, I think, sometimes heated rhetoric from American leaders, including presidents. Um, President Trump, for example, said the Chinese are trying to rape us. Uh, Biden has called Xi Jinping a thug. Um, Xi Jinping has usually been quite restrained in the language he's used about America, at least in public. So I saw those comments. Um, this was at the uh, two sessions uh, meetings that China holds every year. They will go on for another 10 days or so. We're not sure entirely. Um, but it, it was telling that he chose to go there. So I'm worried. I, I think we should all be worried about the escalatory spiral that we're in. We should look for ways in which it is um opportune for both sides to try and find avenues to de-escalate to try to find avenues to cooperate to find wins uh that's the other thing right now there are no quick wins for either side uh on de-escalating and i think all of us in the foreign policy analysis community and the diplomatic community should be looking to find ways um, for these two sides to dial it down because as we know no one has anything to gain. Uh, obviously, not the U.S. and China, um, but not any other country on Earth, whether it's decoupling, deglobalizing, um, or war in Taiwan. Uh, Steve, uh, uh, there's one part of the world which happens to that you're living in that is 
really expressing great worry about uh, the deterioration of the relationship between China and and and, uh, and the United States because they're caught in the middle. This is the Europeans. And today, as we speak, uh, EU Commission President uh, von der Leyen is in the Oval Office meeting with, uh, with Joe Biden, mostly talking about trade and, uh, and subsidy issues. But you have to think that there's got to be uh, at least some time being devoted to the issue of China, with the United States trying to push uh, Europe to become more aligned with its view of of China and the Europeans saying, listen, there's 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 risks here, uh, not just economic but strategic. Uh, what's this scuttlebutt in in, in uh, the European Commission in the EU in Europe uh, generally, and how worried uh, are folks there about the way this relationship is is rapidly uh, spiraling into uh, some kind of escalation, as Ravi put it. I think you've summarized it very well, Ivo. There's a lot of anxiety. Europe doesn't want to be caught in between. China's still a very important trade partner with um, Europe. Volkswagen can't make cars with batteries without China. Um, Europe hasn't developed what it likes to call resilience and what Americans like to call protectionism sufficiently on, on sort of critical raw materials, though they're thinking about it. Um, even, as you say, uh, Ursula von der Leyen's meeting is largely about the weirdly named IRA, which is not the Republican Army, but the Inflation Reduction Act, which Europeans regard as a very serious attack on world trade aimed at China, but which hits them um, and hurts them. And, and they're very much trying to ensure that European companies don't flee to America to get all these lovely subsidies, uh, when the European Union, um, hasn't been able to match them yet. Um, and yes, people are worried about escalation. Of course they are, because there are people in Europe who see the Biden policy against China much the way the Chinese see it as aggressive containment, trying to limit China's access to sophisticated materials, to chips that are developed elsewhere, uh, to contain China's rise, or perhaps better said to slow it down. That seems to be Biden's policy. Biden says, said three times at least, that the U.S. would come to the military aid of Taiwan should China attack. That is not American policy unless somehow Joe Biden's changed it. Um, but from Beijing's he point of view, the president, he is the president and he's the commander in chief. And and China is feeling, again, from the Chinese point of view, a bit surrounded. I mean, you've got America restoring relations with the Philippines better under a new Philippine president. You have Japan going military in a way that it hasn't done before. You have American relations with Vietnam getting, getting better. There's a lot of anxiety in Asia about China too, of course, which um, Washington's playing on. So it is very complicated. I was very actually happy to see that the Republican um, Chairman of the House, Kevin McCarthy's not going to go to Taiwan, but has agreed to meet the Taiwanese leaders elsewhere um, because everyone was afraid of what China might do. So, you know, I think we can we can overestimate the threat China presents. I fear Washington's doing that. Um, Europe certainly feels that. Europe doesn't see China as a peer rival. Um, but Europe is not naive anymore about China either. So I think one shouldn't, you know, underestimate the way even the Germans are thinking through in the next couple of years how to lessen their dependencies for all kinds of things, in, including trade on China. But it is a very difficult moment. And um, there's also quite a lot of amusement at Xi Jinping having two teacups in front of him while everyone else only had one teacup. This was a clear sign of power. Um, and um, it, in a way, Chinese symbolism is extraordinary. It absolutely is extraordinary in this sea of dyed black hair and dark suits. One man has two cups of tea. Very important.
By the way, they were always, all, all, virtually all just men, uh, just to point That's out. Right. Nahal, Nahal uh, uh, you wanted to jump in, and, 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 and I wonder if you can also, in your reporting in, in, in D.C., are seeing any debate internally in the administration on the worry that that I think all of us are expressing about the way this is going and whether there are voices inside the administration saying, listen, we really need to start thinking about how can we talk to them in order to avoid uh, uh, this inevitable, that what looks like this inevitable uh, confrontation. Yeah, look, I, I think some of that has been obvious. I mean, the fact that Secretary Blinken still wants to go to Beijing, uh, even after the spy balloon incident, I think some of the, so there are definitely, there are definitely voices inside the administration that want to kind of calm things down. There are voices outside the administration, not many, uh, but also want to calm things down. They're, I don't think they're necessarily um, getting the kind of attention, but, you know, I also think my, my theory, I have a theory the Biden also really wants to kind of calm things down. And, um, you know, one of the things I, I found interesting is that on the one hand, the U.S. did come out recently and say, we believe that China is considering giving weapons to Russia in its war in Ukraine. Now, that was an interesting move because it was it seemed a little escalatory, but you also could understand the reasoning that the U.S. had to, to make this public. But they also signaled that they were going to declassify the intelligence behind this the way they did with intelligence earlier on, on Russia and Ukraine. But they haven't done that yet. And so my theory is one of the reasons perhaps they haven't done that yet is because they think that if they do, that could aggravate things even more with the Chinese. And so maybe one reason they're holding off on some of that declassification, again, this is speculation on my part, um, is to just see if they can calm things down. That said, the Chinese themselves haven't been helping with some of their rhetoric recently. Um, Wang Yi at uh, Munich was very bellicose, see himself recently, as we've discussed. Um, but at the same time, I think that, you know, U.S. officials look at this and are like, OK, well, he just had this legislative conference or whatever. I mean, some of this could be more for domestic audience com consumption in China. Uh, so they have to weigh all of these all of these different um, factors uh, as they decide what to do. But I, I will say you do also hear more talk or warnings from people like the UN Secretary General from recently the head of the World Trade Organization about this idea of a greater global conflict and are we sleepwalking into it? Um, analysts like Fiona Hill have said, we're already in World War III. We're just failing to admit it. And, you know, but you're hearing more and more and, and the Chinese themselves, some of their rhetoric has hinted at this global conflict as well. Um, but you can't tell sometimes how much of it is to, uh, you know, is to deter it, deter such a conflict, and how much of it is to, um, you know, is because they're not afraid of it. I don't think I don't think there's a lot of people who necessarily want to go to some big war. I mean, I think just recently when you had this Chinese charm offensive right before the spy balloon, remember, like they were all trying to get everybody back on board on the economic front, everything because their economy is struggling. Um, that was a really big sign. It is amazing what um, what a, a single balloon can do. Uh, and one last thing, I will just say, what has ever gone wrong when there's been, gee, only men in charge, right? I mean, what's what's ever gone wrong? Uh, so <laughs> so that, that's that's it for me at the moment. It's a brief history of the world. Yeah, no, I, uh, 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 absolutely. Uh, well, 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 well taken. Well taken. I, I mean, I hope that there are uh, voices that, and and there are voices out there uh, that are reminding people that uh, 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 you don't want to go to World War Three. Uh, I don't think we're in World War Three yet. Uh, a lot of people got killed in World War One and World War Two. That while there are a lot of people being killed, the, the numbers aren't the same. Um, uh, but you do, you do all want to uh, want to. Uh, make sure that it doesn't escalate to that level and, and to have policymakers who are willing to talk to each other. And my, my pet peeve is, for some reason, in the United States, the belief that when you talk to enemies or adversaries or rivals, that that somehow is weakness uh, as opposed to strength, surely is news to Henry Kissinger and Richard Nixon. Um, uh, uh, strength comes uh, by understanding and being willing to engage with your uh, with everyone. And as, Jim Baker used to say, you don't make peace with your friends. You make peace with your enemies. Uh, and uh, I think that's uh, something that we tend to forget in the U.S. debate. 
Um, uh, Steve, let's move on to to um, to Ukraine. Uh, mm-hmm. our, our our weekly look at, at Ukraine, and and it's uh, it's becoming increasingly clear that whether Bakhmut falls or not, which seems to have been sort of the the the, the story that keeps on coming back because, in fact, it doesn't fall, and it hasn't fallen for nine months. Um, uh, it, it looks like the Russian offensive uh, that was much heralded was going to come in, in, in the winter spring is, is, is really not uh, going to be able to achieve any big strategic breakthrough uh, here. And it, and it does raise the question of, are we, are we seeing the end, the exhaustion of Russia, at least as Avril Haines, the director for national intelligence said for the rest of the year, uh, that they won't be able to do anything offensively. It doesn't mean they can't do a lot of defensively, but that there, that, that this, this, this war is, is reaching kind of a stalemate, uh, uh, and that all of the, the thoughts, uh, that 2023 was going to be the decisive war turns out may not, maybe that things aren't going to change very much. What's, what's your perspective? What do you hear, uh, when you talk to folks at NATO and, and, uh, and other places, uh, and how do you see it? Well, I hear a lot of anxiety, I must say, and I am less optimistic, if I can use that word, than Avril Haines. Uh, Russia is a great big place, and it has a lot of people, and it's got a lot of artillery, and it doesn't seem to mind losing people, and this offensive, maybe it's ongoing, maybe it isn't, it's certainly not o- over with. Nor have the Ukrainians started their much heralded offensive, which I don't think will be ready till the end of the spring or or, or um, even early summer. So I'm very hesitant to judge the war until the autumn, when both sides have done what they can in the main fighting season. Um, I don't hear a lot of optimism about a big Ukrainian breakthrough either. I don't think 62 leopard tanks are going to alter the war. Uh, The hope I hear is that the Ukrainians can find some way to break through a vulnerable part of of Russian lines and get closer to the Azov Sea, which might allow them to use the artillery they currently have to begin to hit Crimea. Now, that's a very optimistic look. I think the war is going to go on for a very long time. Uh, I see no reason why Vladimir Putin is going to sit down and and um, begin to negotiate. And I think the minute Zelensky starts to negotiate, he's in political trouble. So I just don't, you know, I, I am not very optimistic about it. Um, the West is spinning constantly about the war. Um, You hear a lot about Russian casualties, which are estimates, but the estimates vary wildly. You hear nothing about Ukrainian casualties because that's a state secret, though though they're also quite high. Um, And everybody's kind of running out of ammunition. I've just done a story about even though Ukraine's on a kind of artillery diet, it's still shooting off a lot more shells than the West can produce. And so the anxiety is, how do you keep the flow going? It's not just the NATO caliber artillery. Um, It's artillery for even the Leopard 2 tanks that we're supposed to be sending. It's for the Leopard 1 tanks that are being pulled out of all kinds of mothballs. Europe can't produce more at this moment, more than 650,000 shells a year. Ukraine wants to use 300 to 400,000 a month. The United States isn't producing more than 20,000 a month. It's hoping to get to 90,000 a month by 2025. So there's a lot of push to get countries that have shells under NATO requirements to hand them over as fast as possible, though there's a lot of anxiety among those countries that they will leave themselves defenseless. So, you know, it's a it's a very ugly, ugly business. Um, and this whole idea that there's gonna be some big breakthrough and, and it's gonna end the war quickly. I mean, I hope I'm wrong, but I really don't see it. I think we're in this for a very long 
fall. And the danger is, and this is, I'm going on too long, but the danger is that China starts helping Russia with these shells. The Russia is trying to get them from North Korea, from lots of other places. That's why the American warning was so important, because I think it did deter China from any open supply of um, of a military aid to Russia, because if the war is one of attrition, which the Ukrainians seem seem to believe and we believe, then the last thing you want is China dumping in stuff to destroy the war of attrition. So it's a it's a very complicated setting, um, and I'm very cautious about making big judgments about what's going to happen. As I say, I think you know in the autumn we'll have a better idea. Uh, I think that's a sobering, um, but I think largely, largely uh, correct uh, uh, analysis. And, and, and Ravi, I, I, I just wonder, given that analysis, one, if you agree, uh, and, and if you don't, please, please, please yes, put your exactly. p- uh, piece on it. But if you agree, it seems to be the debate in Washington is just not taking account of the, the, the realities that Steve is describing, where there continues to be a group of people uh, who say, we just need to give the Ukrainians everything and they will win this war. And it is pretty clear that, one, they're not going to get everything. Um, there are limits to what the United States will provide, uh, both because it needs it for its own defense and there are just limits on what it's willing to provide. But even if it were, it's not clear that that's going to win the war. Uh, uh, and, and others are saying, well, we just need to, this doesn't matter to us. We should just, we should just let it go and and it's more important to go to east palestine than it is to kiev uh to take the the most recent way of uh in which this is presented and that doesn't strike me as a particularly realistic way to think about this either so how should we think about the u.s sort of support for 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 this the u.s uh, nato and other countries of course that's a really good way of framing it and i i agree with everything stephen said um you know War sucks. I I think we shouldn't forget that, you know, Um, and a lot of the impetus uh, of the, I think, the faction that you're describing that criticizes the U.S. response as being incrementalist. So why don't we give them everything they need tomorrow and then everything will be fixed? Um, I understand the impetus for that, that feeling, um, because you want to do something. We all want to do something. Um, But this is their war and war sucks. And uh, yes, we don't know the numbers, but, you know, uh, Harvard will tell you upwards of 170,000 people on both sides have died. Um, economies have been devastated. Um, lives have been devastated. Um, it's hard to see what moves the needle because the Ukrainians rightly so see this as existential. They will fight to the end. Um, and then you have Putin, uh, who doesn't seem to be moved by... Uh, losses in the same way that, for example, even Xi Jinping would. So I think Nahal rightly pointed out at the start of this discussion that Xi Jinping is not, I think her phrase was insanely inflexible. Um, Putin actually is to a degree because for him, this is existential. I don't think he sees this war as one that he can lose or lose face over. Um, He is uh, older than Xi Jinping. I think he needs to see this through and and is willing to live with the losses of life um, and economic. Uh, Although on the economic front, Ukraine has been hit far, far worse than Russia has, even when the full impacts of sanctions kick in over time. So, you know, I'm not sure if I'm able to advance this debate any further than Steve has, but uh, the sad reality is that we are looking at many, many, many months of conflict ahead. Uh, the stalemate kind of implies that it's over, right? That the two sides have agreed to a stalemate. But but this is more of a tug of war where I think we'll see the ebb and flow of one side advancing, then retreating, advancing and retreating. And I think it's clear that over the last three, four months, something has happened, a realization has taken place that Ukraine needs more weaponry. And so it is sort of receiving more of the the heavy artillery that it needs. But the question is, to what end? How does it use it? Uh, How much territory can it recapture? How can it hold on to it? Um, This is going to go back and forth for a very long time. And we must all prepare ourselves for that. Uh, 
uh, Nahal, let me let me uh, uh, sort of push part of that uh, argument a little further. Your your um, uh, publication, Political, published a, a couple of weeks ago a story about uh, Tony Blinken having told a number of. Uh, the Secretary of State, Tony Blinken, have told a number of outsiders that uh, Crimea was a red line for 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 uh, Putin, and and you know even assuming that the Ukrainians are 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 able to achieve what what Steve talked about a, a breakthrough to the Sea of Sea of Azov and then become targeting Crimea, uh, uh, what's the debate in Washington about whether that's a good idea or not? Uh, the debate in in Europe is that's a terrible idea. Um, and a real worry about escalation, including nuclear escalation. Uh, what do you hear about that in in uh, in Washington? Yeah, the general sense from folks I talked to about Crimea is that that's pretty much gone forever uh, from Ukraine. Um, that even if the Ukrainians do really really well uh, and just you know capture the, their east, that sort of thing, Crimea itself is not something that that they might even themselves at that point calculate is worth trying to recapture in terms of the money, the expense, the people, that sort of thing. It's become a very russified territory. There's just, there's a lot of logistical and, and logical reasons to kind of let it go in an unofficial capacity. Now, officially, of course, the US-Ukrainian position is always going to be the Crimea is Ukraine. That might not change for a hundred years. But if you look at the past efforts before 20, actually even even like in the in the wake of the escalation of the invasion last year, um, but you know even going back to 2014, it was pretty clear that the Ukrainians were open to the idea of you know negotiating on everything else, uh, but saying you know what the fate of Crimea, let's just not talk about it for 10 to 15 years. That was some of the options that they put out there. So I think realistically, you know, if would they ever get to that point where they feel like it is worth sitting down now, it is worth negotiating some sort of a deal with the Russians, uh, they might be willing to say, you know what, we can put the Crimea issue on hold. And I think that's a sense in Washington as well, that that is, um, that is something that is, is it would be acceptable in the long run to Ukrainians. But politically, that is not something you want to say uh, if you're Volodymyr Zelensky, right? You would never say that. That would be crazy stupid to say that. Uh, you would lose so much support given what the Russians have done, uh, you know, war crimes, that sort of thing. So they have to take these maximalist positions if they're Ukrainian politicians and say, no, 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 we want everything, we want it all back. They have to do that. It's it's just how you negotiate. It's how you how you think and what you push for. Um, it's you know, but but in the long run, would it would it when they get to the point? Uh, I think there's there's definitely a sense in the Washington that, that Crimea is not necessarily you know gonna gonna return to the Ukrainian hands anytime soon. But, but Stephen, I know you want to yes. jump jump in here, but it, it, I mean, this is this is probably possibly where U.S. Western interest and Ukrainian interest can possibly diverge. Because yes, Nahal's exactly right that that views about Crimea uh, prior to the escalation uh, in in 2022 were more moderate. But once you've gone through what the Ukrainian country as a nation has gone through in the last year, uh, it becomes very difficult to not have maximalist uh, uh, positions, not only politically, but in real life. Uh, yeah. And that if the opportunity is there for the the the, uh, the, the Ukrainians to try to retake Crimea, uh, uh, my sense is that, uh, that Washington and Berlin and Brussels are going to say, that's not a great idea. This is moving in a direction that this war should not be going to and that we've been trying to avoid all along. Yeah, I mean, I think that's true. It's also, I mean, Eastern Ukraine has become pretty russified too, partly because pro Kiev people have either been killed or they've fled or they've been taken in taken into Russia. So the people who are remaining there are pretty hardcore. They're living in a wasteland. Um, so that's the problem. But what what I was going to say is this creates, and I hope people are beginning to think seriously about this, all kinds of questions about how Ukraine looks in the future, what relationship it has to NATO and to the European Union, especially if Russia continues to own a chunk of it or to have a chunk of it or to annex a chunk of it, including this big naval base. I mean, can you have a... 
a member of NATO with a big Russian naval base on its territory. And yet people talk about, oh, security assurances for Ukraine and turning Ukraine into some hedgehog. I mean, these are really complicated questions, and I just don't think people are concentrating on them. They have a lot to think about, obviously, day to day, week to week. But um, this part worries me quite a lot, because if Ukrainians have one big hope, it's Finally, they will fight to join the West, and the West is the EU, the West is, um, is a NATO, and um, are we lying to them? Are we making promises to the Ukrainians that we don't intend to keep, or that we don't believe can, can be kept? And I'm sorry to raise that, but this worries me quite a lot. No, it's a big issue, and and uh, uh, and you're right to start thinking about it. I think people are starting to think about it. It's, it's, it's perhaps one of the incentives that is joining the West for not having a maximalist position territorially to think about it uh, as well. That may be how to think, but the details are very, very difficult. Uh, uh, we'll be back to those, I'm sure, in weeks to come. I want to sh shift over, uh, uh, Ravi, to to India and. Um, uh, a, a country with a very proud foreign policy tradition of independence uh, is is trying to chart its own course uh, in uh, at a time when great power conflict is sort of forcing uh, Delhi to decide which side are you on, how and and how long can you be on the fence, or how many fences can you sit on at the same time to really uh, mangle my uh, my metaphors here. Uh, um, uh, Ravi, you said you, you, this this has become clearer the difficulty that India has in the last few weeks, in part because of the G20 foreign ministry meeting uh, uh, that uh, that happened. Uh, uh, a couple of weeks ago, um, uh, tell us what's what's happened, what the debate is in Delhi, uh, where the the the, the troubles are, uh, and how uh, uh, Modi is going to get out of it. Yeah. So it, before I even get to what what's been going on in the last week and sort of the 2023 framing of of India's foreign policy, I think it's important to note that over the last year. There's been a sort of triumphal kind of tone to how New Delhi has been positioning its foreign policy successes. It has, you know, become closer and closer to the United States over the last, you know, couple of decades or so. But it has done so without giving up uh, the things it wants to hold dear. So it has a historic partnership with Russia since the days of the Soviet Union, for example. Much of its arms come from Moscow. And so, despite U.S. sanctions on Russia over the last year, um, especially on oil and gas, India has dramatically ramped up its purchases of Russian crude. Before the war, it was buying 0.2% of its total crude from Russia. Right now, it is getting nearly a quarter of its total crude from Russia. So it's really cashed in on this moment uh, of cheaper oil prices if you buy it from Russia at a $20 to $30 a barrel discount. And some of this has led Delhi to position itself as you know, a winner in this moment of, uh, you know, great power conflict, hearkening back to the era where India was non-aligned and what they're now calling non-alignment in India is multi-alignment, where you are everyone's friend. You have an a la carte foreign policy where you pick and choose what you want to do given the circumstance. That's the backdrop. Now, to 2023. Um, India is the president of the G20 this year, taking over from Indonesia. It began the year with a big conference where it said it wanted to be the voice of the global south. And it wanted to use this presidency as a way to center discussions on climate change negotiations and the global south's role within them to talk about debt reduction for poorer countries, and et cetera, et cetera. All issues that India cares about, but also that it wants to be seen as a global leader in. And there were a series of G20 meetings in India um, last weekend. Uh, there was a finance minister's meeting. There was a foreign minister's meeting to which they invited um, U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken, but also 
uh, Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov. What happens then? Um, so India, of course, likes to see itself or has been trying to project itself as a leader that sits on all of these fences, as you said, Evo, um, that is able to bring the world together, that is able to mediate. And of course, a fight broke out. Um, you know, uh, none of these sides are in a position where they can agree with each other. You put the US and Russia in a room together, and of course, they're going to throw barbs at each other. And what emerged from it was a sense that maybe India has has gone a bit too far, not only in trying to play this a la carte game indefinitely, but also in trying to sell that as a win. Uh, in a sense, it may have been better off doing this more quietly instead of trying to convene countries and act like it can actually fix everyone's problems, uh, which it is not positioned to do. So very interesting set of developments over the last few weeks. And then I think leading forward into COP28 later this year, into other into the main G20 meetings, what does this mean for global cooperation, for the role of the global South in wider conflicts, in global negotiations over climate change? And can India keep playing this game of multi-alignment? I think every other country in the global South will be watching this very closely for signs of how they too should act. Uh, fascinating analysis, Ravi, and I think mm -hmm. uh, uh, the, 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 the attempt to be everybody's friend and represent everybody's interest is kind of difficult when uh, the friends that you want to have are actually at loggerheads with each other. And, and, and at some point, you ought, to, you, know, the, the, you ought to choose, and you can't be just the representative of the, Joe, of the global South and have a conflict with China, and at the same time, uh, uh, hope that Russia and the United States would come to Delhi and agree on, uh, on, on Ukraine. Uh, it's, it, that's a hard uh, act to follow. Uh, Nahal. Yeah, I mean, the whole trying to be friends with everybody thing, like, I think I tried that strategy in high school, and it, like, it just didn't <laughs> work. Um, I mean, look, it, it's like, at a certain point, you have to stand for something and believe in something. And so if everybody thinks you're their friend, and then you don't do what everybody wants you to do, then they all feel betrayed by you and like, you know, stabbed in the back. And then it's like, what's the point? And you know, I, I mean, unless you're like a bird or like an elite level gymnast, I don't I don't know that sitting on a fence has ever been something anybody's really managed to do very well. I mean, you just tend to fall. So um, I, I find the whole India thing just absolutely fascinating. Um, I think, you know, Ravi's points were all excellent. I will just add, you know, one thing that this has done is <laughs> is make India basically impervious to um, any U.S concern about its human rights issues, its rollback of dem democracy on, on the inside, its, its abuses of, of Muslims, uh, you know, among the, the within, by, by the Modi government. I mean, this is, there's a lot of internal tumult in India on this front. Uh, they're cracking down on civil society. They did a 60 hour raid of the BBC that they said was for tax purposes um, and all this stuff. And the U.S., can't say anything. I mean, the Biden administration just will not voice any serious concern about the human rights abuses in India uh, on a public basis. And if they're doing it privately, it clearly isn't having much impact. Um, you know, when Secretary Blinken was asked about some of this stuff during the G20 ministerial in Delhi the other day, his response was to say, well, being a democracy is hard and we have our issues too. And it was like, are you serious? Um, and, you know, I've, I've talked to people at the State Department, I reported this, who who say that our embassy there is basically like suffering from clientitis, that they don't really report what's really happening, that they're too scared to tell anybody in Washington what's really going on there. And so in the long run, it's just one of these things where, you know, again, we're we're partnering with India for a lot of uh, very, very understandable reasons. But at the same time, like, it just means we're like looking away at, from a lot of things that a lot of actions by the Indian government that we criticize the Chinese government for doing. And it's hypocritical and people notice it. And so in some ways, sitting on the fence is working for the Indians in this in this particular way. That, that's that's part that's part of what you're trying to balance to let, you know, in, in, in some ways uh, would help. I, I think if the U.S. had an ambassador in India uh, to um uh, to uh, to to counter the clientitis that might exist, mm -hmm. uh, uh, Steve. Uh, you know, the, there was a time when the Europeans thought that they could have a special relationship with India, uh, in part because not that the Europeans are fence sitters, they're not, uh, but they they also are trying to maneuver themselves uh, as a as a third fourth 
uh, power sure. between the big powers that are out there. Uh, and India is a, in that way, a logical partner for them. So uh, just a final word to you. Yeah, I agree with that. It's just that the problem with wars is they create difficult bed partners and they create silence. I remember Strobe Talbot coming to Russia when the Russians were clobbering Chechnya, shrugging and saying, well, we had a civil war too. I mean, so there's a, there's a kind of omerta that rules when you're pulling people onto your side. We would love India to provide some Soviet caliber shells to Ukraine, which really needs it. We would like lots of things, but we are trying not to push India too far into Russia's corner. And we're helped, obviously, by a long standing rivalry with China. But um, the global south is a problem. It sees this war in Ukraine not as World War III, but as a little local difficulty. And it isn't going to get dragged in. So part of the silence, I suppose, is trying to make sure it stays relatively neutral. Um, and it's ugly. It's ugly, but that's how the world works. I'm sorry. Well, um, we'll, we'll have to now. Just one quick thing. And, you know, part of the reason we're at this stage with the global south is because the United States has largely ignored so much of Latin America and Africa for so long. I mean, this is partly a result of U.S. underinvestment of attention, resources, diplomacy, whatever, in those regions for so long. Uh, absolutely. Uh, uh, no doubt that uh, that. Uh, having a great power uh, framework in your foreign policy means that you have to forget about uh, much of the rest of the world. And, and, and India is trying to find a way to play a game. And we'll have to watch uh, uh, whether in the G20 meeting uh, coming up, uh, uh, the, the, the Leader Summit meeting in, in, in September, uh, how India is going to try to play this game uh, forward. But uh, Ravi, thanks for, for putting the, the issue in the way that you did. Very useful. Uh, we're run out of time, unfortunately, uh, for, for, for this week. Uh, so I want to thank uh, Nahal Tusi, uh, Steve Erlanger, and Ravi Gagarwal for uh, a really excellent and in-depth uh, discussion about some very, very important issues. We'll be back next week with another edition of World uh, Review. And until then, have a wonderful weekend.